Now, I've never personally done shrooms, mushrooms. I think they're delicious, but let's talk to someone who knows everything about mushrooms. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I am pleased to have on today the director of Fantastic Fungi, Louis Schwartzberg. Louis, thank you for being on the Film Threat Podcast. Hey, my pleasure. I loved your documentary. It's, um, I mean, just as I think maybe it's the the child in all of us, uh, nature documentaries are particularly fascinating. I've never seen an entire documentary about mushrooms. Um, I, I mean, you know, I've heard about the medicinal, um, you know, medicinal uses of mushrooms. But you in this documentary, it, it's it's not just a doc about mushrooms and their potential medicinal purposes. This documentary is incredibly spiritual in your your approach. You. Tell me where this whole project came from. Well, it actually started about 13 years ago when I heard Paul Stamets do a talk at Bioneers. And at the time I was already working on a film, Wings of Life for Disney Nature, which was about pollinators marinated by, narrated by uh, Meryl Streep. And so I've always been on this journey of trying to unveil the, the mystery. You know, flowers are critical for life on our planet. Without flowers, there's no bees. Uh, without bees, no flowers, no food, no nuts, fruits, vegetables, seeds, all the healthy food we need. And then you think, well, what do plants need? Well, they need soil. Where does soil come from? Then you discover they come from the largest organism uh, and the largest kingdom on the planet. The fungal kingdom and so i'm always you know taking a deeper dive into the mystery trying to make the invisible visible trying to broaden our horizons and our perspective on getting outside of the human centric point of view of life on our planet which obviously has gotten us in trouble um so yeah for me it's a it's a journey of discovery <clears throat> i think it's why a lot of people relate to the film um, in so many ways, because like it is like being like a little kid. It's that sense of wonder, that aha moment. Because when you discover something that's obvious, it's way more thrilling than discovering something that's really like trivial. Like, you know, knowing what microbe lives on Mars, as opposed to learning that there's 40 trillion, you know, bacteria and viruses in and, and inside and outside your body. I mean, that blows your mind. So, you know, that's the part that's kind of exciting. You go, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> and so I also want to say I appreciate, you know, the comment about that it's a spiritual experience. I feel that when you can alter time and scale and also show truth, when I say alter time and scale, like slow-mo and time-lapse and macro and micro photography, I'm, Chris, I'm showing you what's real. You know, it just happens to be outside the spectrum of what the human eye can see. But when you see that, that's more amazing than even the special effect. Like in a movie where you blow up Mars, you blow up the Empire State Building, and you kind of know that it's fake. I'm showing you stuff that's real. And I think that touches the deepest part of your soul because it resonates that it's the truth. And we live in a world now of fake news when getting a little bit of hardcore truth feels so good. <laughs> well, it's it's really interesting the approach that you took. I mean, the the way that you lovingly photographed these uh, these mushrooms. I, I encourage anybody watching this after you're done to go and uh, so first of all see the movie, but uh, at least check out the trailer for the film, which is so incredible. Um, the way you used music, the way you photographed the mushrooms. What I found amazing too is just everything that I learned. I kind of feel like um, you know we that. All the things that currently exist, plants in the animal kingdom, are going to solve most, if not all, of our problems. And you demonstrate this in one of the one of the most amazing portions of the film. Um, you show uh, the effects of an oil spill, mm -hmm. and here's an here are two places where you have an oil spill, right? And in one instance, you use traditional cleaning right. methods, and the other instance, you use a type of mushroom to clean the oil from the spill, and the results are incredible. Um, what led to that, and and what was it like to document that? Well, the beautiful thing is, you know, what 
what, what fungi do is they break down organic matter and oil actually happens to be organic. It's, it's, you know, decomposed, you know, forests and trees, you know, going back millions and millions of years. And so when you're breaking down these molecules, what you're doing is you're creating regeneration. So more than just cleaning up a toxic, you know, waste site, what it does is it brings it, that ecosystem back into its natural cycle. You break down these molecules, the molecules become food for little tiny grasses or plants, and that becomes food for insects. And then the birds come. And then before you know it, you've got a garden, you know? So that's the beauty of it. They are the grand recyclers of nature. Imagine if nothing ever broke down. We would be just choking on, you know, dead organic matter. So they're a critical partner in the, you know, cycle of life which we have to, um, I think, nurture and respect. And, you know, besides cleaning up a toxic oil spill, they can clean up the atmosphere. You know, the partnership that they have with trees is incredible that, you know, trees with photosynthesis, you know, take in carbon dioxide, they release oxygen, but then the carbon goes down the trunk of the tree into the roots. And in this underground, <clears throat> underground network, mycelium network there's like a, it's like a shared economy under the ground a giant internet where nutrients are being shared between trees and that is where carbon can be sequestered so you have this incredible natural engine on planet earth that could literally clean the atmosphere scientists claim that if we stop putting fossil fuel you know co2 into the atmosphere hypothetically we could actually clean the atmosphere in five years just by letting trees and plants do their thing. It's well, it, it, it's it's interesting. I saw a TED talk once about wearing a mushroom suit. You kind of touch on yeah. this, um, that that will help the human body decay in a way that actually benefits the the environment. Um, you, you detail so many incredible stories that I was unaware of about the the uses of fungus and mushrooms, not just for medicinal purposes, but what you just mentioned. Wh wh why is it that this is not, I kind of feel like all these tools are out there. Are there other forces at work that are sort of preventing these things that are just in nature? I feel like we we live in an age where homeopathic methods of yeah. solving our, our own medical issues is uh, is more widely accepted, right? Because I think we've got the prescription drug industrial complex has um, gotten people addicted to drugs that are we probably don't need, and right. I'm I'm not sure that I entirely trust um, their motivations when it seems to be motivated by money. Why are we not studying this more more closely? Well, you have these opposing forces. Like, why aren't we using solar and wind? You know, when we had that technology around for 50 years, you've got a, a giant fossil fuel, you know, industry lobby, and um, we're not making the change in our behavior. Um, same thing would be true, as you mentioned, like with medicines and big pharma. Same thing is also true in regards to our, our food. You know, why aren't we growing a tomato in our backyard as opposed to like having a tomato grown in Mexico shipped you know, across the border, refrigerated, put in plastic, so you go to the grocery store and buy it and create a giant, you know, uh, carbon footprint. The, we just have to, um, I think, go back to the natural way of doing things. And I think the pandemic has really made us perhaps wake up to be more sustainable um, because, uh, you know, we, we just can't do all the wasteful things we used to do Therefore, we have to learn how to be more resilient and more self-sufficient, which means getting off that, you know, treadmill of inefficiency. You know, it's just, I mean, in, in nature, everything is efficient. Nature doesn't waste a single molecule. Why are we grossly inefficient? It has to do with capitalism and greed and making money and, you know, all those things that have skewed the behavior of our culture and our population. And so maybe this pandemic is a wake up call for us to get back to living in harmony with nature. It makes all the sense in the world. I, I think it's certainly pointed out all the 
flaws and the problems with uh, especially the United States, how many problems have gone unaddressed for so long and now they're just very present because we we've we've not dealt with it. So um yeah, so yeah, I, I I never even thought about that. The, the you know getting a tomato at the grocery store when you could just grow them in your backyard. I my my I was fortunate enough. My grandparents they would um, take us uh, picking. We would pick uh, raspberries and cherries and apples. They'd weigh your baskets when you go in. Yeah. Then they weigh them on the way out, and you you pay for what you pick. But also they had a garden. They would you know they they did all of that. I don't know. I, we we live in such complex times. Times, and I think that the, the pandemic has allowed us the opportunity to slow down and then really examine these issues. Um, I started at the top talking about how spiritual this yeah. film is. There's um, so much in the movie because you really approach the topic in a very, uh, in a very, looking at it very humanistically. Um, it, the, the way that, that you're looking at all of these, here are problems that we have. Here's, here's a person or a conduit to tell, to tell that story. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? I found that just made the, the documentary with, in addition to the music and the way that you told the story, it's a very, I, I know I'm not the only person to tell you this. Other people have said they've been moved by a documentary about mushrooms. I know that right. sounds crazy to say, right. but I know uh, everyone I've spoken to who's seen the film feels the same way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of funny again, the film, some people come up and say, I cried, you know? I go, but it's not a sad movie. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting, and I didn't really understand this either when I started the project, but the main message that came out of the movie is interconnection. And that is truly the new lens I think we need to look at uh, in terms of life, the broadest definition of life. Instead of like, oh, there's these organisms and we're at the top of the food chain, like this linear thing, it's the interconnection it's the symbiotic relationships. It's this giant relationship between the fungal kingdom and you know the, the plant kingdom, you know, six times more species than plants. All this is going on under our feet and we don't know about it. And so that interconnection, I think, relates also without being preachy. And that's why maybe potentially it's spiritual. Because basically it says you know, do unto others as you would do unto yourself, you know, having a shared economy, not based on greed, but that everybody can flourish, um, you know, regeneration, symbiosis, uh, nurturing, uh, rebirth. I mean, this is more like the feminine side of nature. This is the story we that is going to get us out of the, the hole we're in right now. The old story was survival of the fittest, doggy dog, um, you know, kill or be killed, which, you know, gets ratings, you know, on, on TV uh, with predator versus prey, uh, because you're you're pressing that old fashioned primal fear button, which, you know, most Hollywood movies still do as well, you know. Um, so a story about um, harmony and connection and regeneration, uh, the miracle of, you know, 40 trillion you know, organisms in your one human body that is working in synchronicity in order for you to be alive. Wow, what a story. And how do we nurture that story? And, and especially with COVID, what's the worst thing about COVID? The worst thing is like being disconnected from your friends and from your family, right? Well, this story, this movie is all about interconnection. So maybe the real story of life is to look at not studying, you know, these organisms and plants. And it's like, what is the relationship between them? What is the energy between them? That is really the secret sauce. Uh, it's, I, I, I'm just really curious what people in the professional sphere think of the, think of the film, people who may be able to affect change, people in the medical fields, what, 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 what are their thoughts when they see it? I know, I know I was moved. I watched the film twice. Uh, I, I was just like, so I, I, I just like so much to take in. There's so much, the beauty, the stories, but, but um, how have people who could really are in positions um, that could affect change? What has yeah. their reaction been? 
Well, definitely in the area of the, um, of, you know, medical use of uh, psychedelics, um, which is a giant movement that's happening right now. There's probably 50 universities that are now finally doing the studies. But um, the fact that it can help people with PTSD, uh, as we saw in the movie in jo at John Hopkins, you know, two patients with a severe diagnosis of cancer, um, the fact that they were able to have one treatment, not like, you know, Prozac that you have to take day after day for 20 years with no improvement, but with one treatment, they were able to experience this, you know, um, connection that everything is one. And it was such a profound experience. They therefore then lost their fear of dying, which enabled them to embrace living. And to this day, both Judy and Tony in my movie are alive. I think that's a major breakthrough. Um, it's being used with veterans with PTSD. We're actually going to launch a trial at the Pacific Neuro Institute in Santa Monica in the fall using my nature imagery on the giant 85 inch TV, 4K, 5.1 audio um, with psilocybin to treat patients for alcohol addiction. This is what was being studied in the, in the late 50s and the early 60s before the government, Richard Nixon, shut down all the research at all the leading universities at Stanford, at Harvard. Um, and that's what forced this research and psychedelics to go underground. And, you know, there was a lot of negative fallout from all of that. It had basically had escaped the lab. But now the research is like phenomenal. And there's billions of dollars pouring into it. I'm sure Big Farm is going to try to figure out how to corner it. But a lot of people know how to grow mushrooms in their closet. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting. You know, if it drafts off the, the speed at which cannabis has become accepted, not only for medicinal purposes, but also recreationally in you know, California, where I live, um, I think it's going to happen really fast. Well, I, I, I would agree with that. Just as someone who's been around the indie film scene for a very long time, one of the most popular types of documentaries were documentaries about marijuana and the medicinal benefits and the legalization of it. And now we've seen through, I mean, I must have seen like 20 or 30 different <laughs> documentaries about marijuana, but now that change has occurred. And yeah. your, your documentary is the a touchstone towards beginning this, this movement to study this more, more intently, to see the practical applications, as you mentioned, PTSD. And, and, and the way that you're even releasing your film is very grassroots, yeah. um, which I think is awesome. I, 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 I really think that just interviewing so many different types of filmmakers, um, I think it's important that as many tools as possible or ways of doing things are available or widely known. So you have a website, you, you, you're doing virtual, you're, you've done virtual screenings, Q and A's, yes. you, you're, you're doing, you can, you can get the movie on iTunes. Um, tell me what the website is and where people can follow yeah. for more information. Well, definitely go to fantasticfungi.com and you'll have the option of um, being able to watch it on iTunes or even on our own website through a VHX Vimeo link. Either way, um, I'm excited that like August 4th, it's going to be on iTunes, Apple TV, which means we're going to a wider audience. I mean, have I been preaching to the choir? Possibly. Did I, did I take it out on the road as an indie, which I think you appreciate? You know, we opened up in Denver, first city to decriminalize, you know, psilocybin. Then we went to Portland. We broke records in these art house theaters. We got 100%, you know, thumbs up, rotten tomato score, right? Uh, the critics loved it. Everyone from Rex Reed to who, whoever, Forbes, you know, you name it. And I think that um, the release of the film has been a mirror of the mycelial network. So we basically did no marketing and or advertising. We spread the word through the mycelial network. We're showing up, and guess what? We sold out like well over 500 screenings. Um, before COVID hit, we were on a, a tear, you know, a, a quote unquote tear. We grossed about 2.2 million, which is pretty amazing for a doc, you know? And um, it's not a lot of money, but it's respectable considering no budget. It's a no lot of money. I, I, yeah. I, could, I could use 2.2 million. That would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but when COVID hit, one of the things we did was, 
you know, we were going to have like a one night event with 500 theaters. When COVID hit, we went and pivoted to a virtual online release, but we brought the theaters along with us. If they ended up, you know, like showing the film, you know, um, um, sharing the film with their audience, we ended up splitting the ticket price with the local art house theaters, which then indirectly also went to food banks at the beginning of COVID. So wow. um, it was the whole idea was to be like the mycelial network, you know, this shared economy. Everybody flourishes if we all do well. Well, uh, first of all, I have to thank you for that because as someone who loves to go to the movie theater, it's a habit of mine. Uh, I've been going to the drive-in every week. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I think that that's, uh, that's amazing. We really need our independent theaters to survive. Um, we need the movie movie-going experience to be preserved. So uh, I thank you for that. Um, Louis Schwartzberg, thank you so much. The, the movie is absolutely beautiful. Unlike any, it's, it's really an indescribable ex experience, not just a nature documentary, not just a documentary. It, it, it's, it's, there's a humanity to it that makes it unlike any type, type of film that I've seen in that category. It's just, it's just fantastic. So thank you so much for being with us on the Film Threat Podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, for all the great work you do. Really appreciate it as well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.